Hello and welcome to what's sure to be an interesting panel session on balancing AI innovation with library ethics. Um, I'm Emma Wilson Shaw, the user resource manager for Open Athens. Um, I'm somewhat of a novice when it comes to AI, so I've had a, a great time kind of listening to Bella's key, excellent keynote speech a little bit earlier, and I'm interested to hear what our panelists are going to have to say in our session. We have around um, 30 minutes with a range of questions for them to answer that we've prepared earlier, um, but we also have space and time for audience questions, so do feel free to use the Q&A as we go along as questions occur to you. Um, I'm going to let um, Bella just maybe reintroduce herself in case folks weren't here a little bit earlier, and then colleague John as well. All right, so hello again, everyone. I'm Bella, I'm the data services librarian in SMU. So I basically support and enable computational data methods for SMU, for the use of in research and learning for SMU community. Uh, and I'm, I'm John Bentley, I'm the commercial director for Open Athens. I also work within the trust and identity team within JISC. And actually the perspective I'll be bringing throughout this session is um is is JISC's view of AI and the work we do with the H higher education and further education communities in the UK. JISC um, as an NREN, we run uh, UK infrastructure with regards to connectivity and cybersecurity, and JISC is also working with the government in trying to understand policy um, and a and a kind of a, a UK academic approach to, to making the making the most of AI but also managing the risks that are inherent. Thanks, John. Great. Um, we're going to start with probably quite a big question. I know Bella's um, addressed some of this a little bit earlier, but it probably bears repeating. So what's happening at the moment in AI, maybe from what you're interested in, your corner of kind of academia, your corner of the universe? What, what, what's the new thing for you? What, what are you interested in that's happening right now? So what's happening right now, there are a lot of things happening. <laughs> so uh, at least for academia side of the like, library, in terms of like discovery and search tools and things that will be relevant for research process, um, there are a lot, a lot of new exciting tools for that. And um, things that I've mentioned earlier in my presentations, I, I don't know if you guys heard of use this before, things like SciSpace, um, Alicit.com. So it's basically like a search engine that could, it, it can do um, convert, essentially convert your natural language form into like search queries. Um, and then it can, the, the, the amazing thing about this is it can create like a metrics, a uh, citation metrics for you. So they like a metrics, what's the um, research methods and all that. So it's, it's been amazing. Um, I've been using that a lot myself. Recently, and it's it's kind of fascinating how these tools evolve as AI also progress. And I think one of the most um, important, or what I, I say is quite exciting breakthrough in AI, is that the context window of a lot of the large language models like Gemini that Google recently released are getting bigger, which means we can fit more information in a single form. So um, a context window is something like um, the, the memory, the, how many, how, how big of information that the AI can have at one time. And most has been frustratingly limited in the sense. So you can like only, let's say if you're trying to fit it a couple of pages, like fit it information at most, you can fit like maybe 12 pages, let's say. But nowadays, um, with the, the recent Gemini one can fit approximately like, 750,000 words, they say, which I think can be like an entire book in memory. And then you can like interact with this book, like chat about this book with the, with the chat box. So yeah, things like that. Sounds really exciting. John, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I think, in, so from a UK perspective, I think there's two major areas where JISC is really looking into AI. The, the first one is assessment and that recognition mm -hmm. that more and more students uh, at a tertiary level and actually at secondary education in the UK as well, more and more students are using um, AI tools to generate their work, generate their ideas, and in some, some instances, actually generate the, the essays that they're putting forward. So 
So there's a big part of assessment. And in a, in a way, it's actually how can you use those AI tools to actually analyze some of the work that is being done to ensure that the, the quality of work that you're seeing is actually the student's work itself. Um, related to that is that issue of trust. And I think that trust comes from understanding which are the large language sets that are being used to generate the output. So there is a lot of work. So for example, JISC as an organization, we have an AI policy that has been put in place by the organization itself. And a lot of that is about the, the parameters around the models that you, you use. Um, they're not saying don't use AI to generate, you know, the, the blank screen can be a scary space. So lots of people use AI as that initial trigger um, to generate ideas, but um, that, that you need a human at the beginning and a human at the end. I think someone has said that, that before in terms of that process. So it's actually understanding that the, the data that is being used in our models, not only is our work protected, so we don't want leakage out into that mm -hmm. broader AI ecosystem, but we also want to understand that the data that we that we are using is of the appropriate provenance. I know there is um there's an organization called ORCID, which is that research identifier. You know, they have data that could be used to kind of um, validate the, the the validity of um some of the data that's used i think that's important and also there are tools and i think this is what i found really interesting from bella's um presentation earlier is is the the need to cite your sources when you're using ai tools i think there was one institution in the us that was allowing people to use chat, chat gpt um in their work as long as chat gpt was cited now there's a sort of a chain of indemnity about that because actually so how far back do, do those resources in that work go? But I think in, in terms of that trust, you need transparency. And I think that's one of the key, the key things moving forward is transparency in and around use of AI. Did you have a follow-up to that, Bella? I, I kind of, I, I, I agree with John in terms of having the framework, because I think when ChatGPT was released, well, when viral last year, um, one of the first few things that our university did was to came up with like a framework uh, or a position statement of what the university state uh, stands on this and provided some kind of like guidance, uh, a framework like, okay, maybe this is, um, this is the acceptable use and then maybe this is how you can probably integrate um, the use of AI in your uh, assessment. Like, so it has been quite an emphasis on that, uh, particularly because like John said, you, you, we can't we can't stop them from using it. We can, but we can provide framework of guidance for both the teachers, uh, the the faculty, and the students, and how to navigate this. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, both. Um, it's kind of a follow on question. We've covered this a little bit already, but um, there's just a question around kind of Bennett balancing the benefits against kind of some of the potential risks. I don't know if you want to explore that a little bit further. I, I think it's, it's a difficult thing to do. And even among the experts, there's a lot of disagreements in that sense. So um, it's a tricky thing to do as well, because like one thing, AI can actually be quite helpful in your work, but then there is also the implications surrounding it so like the legal and ethical implications surrounding it so like how how do we balance that um again we the, the framework could be one thing raising awareness could be um one thing but yeah it's, it's a it's a difficult job in a sense that we're, we're all i um, believe that we're all trying to keep john any input well, I, thought, I mean, it's interesting because that, that question between the benefits and the risks, it forces you to think about what are those benefits and are, mm -hmm. are what those risks. AI, in a way, is almost like a solution that didn't have a specific problem to solve. Mm -hmm. Certainly when a, AI sort of burst onto the scene, what ChatGPT, I think, was 14 months ago. Um, it seems much longer than that. But when it sort of came onto the scene, people, we, I was, you know, I was using it to write... Um, 
comedy poems about open Athens. And I'm sure that wasn't the reason it was, you know, it was created. So trying to understand what problems it is solving. And I think what it is solving is processing huge amounts of information quickly and efficiency. And again, Bella, you mentioned, you mentioned efficiency and that mm -hmm. ability to get to a possible answer, answer earlier. I know in the medical world, um, it is being able to sort of process images really, really quickly and look for patterns. So that's mm -hmm. corneal cancer and that, the, the ability to, to do that quickly and accurately and then be checked. So there's so potentially speed um, is the primary benefit, but comes that with yeah. enormous risks. Um, so again, that that phrase hallucination, the, 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 the fact that the large language models are really just trying to think of the next best word. There is no, in fact, you know, it's a bit of an oxymoron. There is no intelligence involved in artificial intelligence. It really is just speed and automation um, and algorithms. So it, I think that is one of the risks that we we give it more power than we should mm -hmm. do, and we lean into it, it lean into it too heavily. Um, the risks about the the data set that it might be modelling. So, and again, another example is it might be running, you know, it might be processing a thousand ebooks, but the, the, the model itself doesn't know which of those books are fiction and which of those books are non-fiction. So, it, so again, the, the boundaries within which you use AI. I think are incredibly important um and that's you know and it's that again it comes back to that, as that aspect of trust and transparency is absolutely critical so that those outputs um you know don't take us down the wrong path i think yeah and again like like you said the data sets that they use to train could be it may contain bias and that oh might yes yeah absolutely yeah totally. that might affect, yeah that might affect the way well, the way AI will respond to your problem, then that could be dangerous in certain cases. Oh, yeah, no, totally, absolutely. That's a massively important point, actually, because we're running this conference in the English language. Most of the, you know, yeah. there's an inherent bias in that kind of that Western English approach to the world. So, our, you know, that West, that, in, that English speaking community, you know, mm. they're the ones who seem to book. And again, I have to, that's from my perspective, but that's where a lot of the work is, is, is it coming from and, it, and is that propagating our inherent you know western bias that definitely needs to be i mean there's a fantastic book i think it's safia noble called the algorithms of oppression which is yeah, you know I think that's the the data that these models are using who's you know who's checking that yeah that's so that bias is a massively important point yeah um shall we Let's take the next question. Yeah. Um, I mean, Bella's talked about this well quite a lot already, but we, we were talk, we're asking about um, kind of examples of practical benefits to AI. So, for you personally, or, or in your kind of work or library setting, um, practical benefit. Um, yeah, I kind of touched on a, a bit of that in my uh, sessions earlier, but like let's say plus my maybe my personal experience. Um, well, I use ChatGPT um, a lot, <laughs> and also I use it and perplexity mostly for fixing my grammar because English is not my first language. Um, yeah, and it like um, but in the in the context of my work, I'm like I use Elicit a lot or size based some of their AI tools, and I think I found myself using them more the more than Google Scholar nowadays, which is quite um interesting, honestly. <laughs> Yeah, um, they are quite um, how to say um, they're quite convenient in that sense, and there was they these tools nowadays that I think they understand that transparency and the ability to kind of like link back to the source is becoming more more and more important. So a lot of the tools nowadays actually try to give you a source of like where did they get the statements from or where they what's the source of this uh, paragraph that they generated. So. Um, from my experience, though, it has not been super. There are some cases where they kind of like backfire, not, not backfire, like not accurate. So it's like the efficiency comes with accuracy in that sense. And again, depends on issue. If, if that's something that you're willing to, you're okay with. So, but if you if you think accuracy is very important, then yeah, then it might not be the tools for you. 
So, I, I mean, Emma, for my, yeah. I'm going to give two examples. I will give a library perspective, um, which we shared from the, the sessions earlier in the day, and then I will give a, a perspective from from a sort of publishing platform and a, a content provider. The I think the, the the library example was AI's ability to process data when looking at historical texts um, and images. So that ability to to take digitalized images of of archived information of um, of manuscripts, being able to remove the white space, being able to process that information really really quickly and convert it into machine readable text. I think that you know that that's the kind of area. It's those dull, difficult, tedious jobs that need to be done. I think that's where AI and that processing power can really make a difference. Um, Again, I guess it's a bit like the butterfly effect. You need to be really conscious of the slight data. Again, it needs to be checked because a, you know, a slight error could have a, a much larger impact further downstream. So that that's where you see the processing power having a really impact. From a publisher's perspective, I think what the publishers want to do, given the amount of content that they have, and I'm talking about premium public, I mean, Wikipedia, you could probably do a whole piece on Wikipedia and, and what data in Wikipedia, what that would power. But what you do see is those platforms taking their protected content that they have, their proprietary content, and trying to run those models over it and creating a service for patrons and users in a library. And I think, and it's and there's one that I've that I've seen demonstrated. There's a there's a platform called You Know, um, which essentially is a discovery platform into contents, but the way it does it is it it's it looks to draw um, contextual um, connections between different data sets. So when it's presenting the data to you, it's kind of making those assumptions that these two pieces of whether it's a, a manuscript or a video, these two pieces could, could come together. So I think what publishers are looking to do is take advantage of a lot of the data that they have under copyright, because I think that's another interesting thing for the platforms is that is that copyright relationship they have with the content that they've created and making that more accessible and more usual, more useful to sort of patrons and researchers. So um, and I think that's I think that's at an early stage, because I think certainly for those publishing platforms, they are looking to partner with existing AI technologies rather than de developing the AI technology themselves. And you know, you you will see, and I don't have any to hand, but you know, there are there are lists of um AI platforms that you can use. And you can again get back to Pele's presentation, those those hackathons looking at the, the different array of um tools out there that you can test. I don't think the publisher platforms are necessarily developing themselves, but they're looking to see how they can integrate them with the data that they have. Um I don't uh, that gives me another idea, like uh, some of the practical um, implicate, um, implementations of AI in the libraries. Um, can, I'm not sure if this is uh, practical, but more like in the realm of possibility of low-hanging fruit could be like a recommender system based on machine learning, like all the data that we have. We could, okay, we, we do have recommender systems right now, but perhaps AI can make it even better in a way. Yeah, so totally, yeah. Definitely. Um, shall we take another question? Um, okay. what, what, what have we got? Um, let's talk about skills, I think. What kind of uh, new skills or skills that would a librarian need to kind of keep up with the AI world? What, what, are, you, what are you kind of interested in learning? What do you, where do you think you might go next with your learning? Um, okay, so um, in terms of skill that librarians would probably find useful. I, I think having an understanding of the fundamental concepts of how AI work would definitely be helpful as a starting point. So like concepts such as um, training data sets, testing data set, um, how do AI actually learn? Like, um, and then some various methods, technical methods, if you want to delve that way. And then some of the terms that, um, like a glossary of terms that you might find useful could be like context windows and all that. So basically um, fundamental concepts. So where you go depends, where you go from there depends on which areas or use case of AI that you want to delve into because AI right now can be applied to like almost 
a lot of things, almost anything, right? So it's kind of impossible. You're trying to keep up with everything. So like, kind of chemically. So like, for example, for myself, I'm kind of interested in audio transcriptions right now. Um, like um, so how it has evolved a lot thanks to um AI right now. So that's one one area I'm currently trying to kind of like teach myself about. So um yeah, whether it's or audio transcription and translation, which would actually be useful for people researchers who are conducting um interviews or focus groups. Like um before AI, usually what they do is they hire someone to listen to and transcribe it, which is a very um mundane task, like tedious. But now AI can do that to a to quite a good degree of accuracy, I would say. So I'm like. Um, delving into this topic a little. Um, having a technical skill won't hurt either, I would say, but um, yeah, but not to the level of like programmers, but I think theoretical concept is fine, I would say. So I think um I think digital literacy is is yes. going to be key. Um and I think you know digital literacy is quite a broad catch-all, but within mm -hmm. that understanding how the the is it neural networks but certainly how the machine learning machine the machine yeah language I think, helps i think the word that they use is algorithmic literacy okay which is kind of a narrower concept um uh, like part of the digital literacy umbrella but like a bit of a narrower concept i believe that's what yeah yes yeah, so. so having the curiosity i think is absolutely key and i yeah. I mean, a lot of the training manuals, a lot of the the information I see is is about prompts and training people to write effective prompts. But for, for me, I don't think that really pull, uh, pulls the veil back far enough. I think you, I think it, particularly for for libraries who who are a lot of librarians who are the create curators of information that they need to understand where it's coming from and what the, what the algorithms are that are driving the yeah. results um, that come out. I think. Um, those standard issues of ethics, I think, is really, really important. Definitely. Certainly, if anybody is developing their own model, that you you have to have ethics built in at the front, because by the time it's released out into the wild, that would be too late. Um, you need to get that um, upfront thinking and planning. Um, I do think that that sort of curiosity and those library skills um, can really help, can help the delivery of AI tools. And I think that's certainly where that kind of that access to the information should sit. So I think the traditional librarian skills in terms of understanding data, um, understanding the distribution of knowledge are going to be really, really valuable, particularly in that academic setting, um, helping learners yes. and researchers make the most of it. It is. And um, actually, believe it or not, information retrieval is now a hot topic again. <laughs> so if you go to Everything our archive, yeah, the preprint, uh, the preprint um, server, which where I think most of the AI research are uh, put out. So there is a lot of research on that, uh, like info retrieval. So it's like, oh, it's, it's like everybody's on it now. So that, that's one good thing about it. So yeah, we're cool again. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. We've got quite a lot of ground. Um, I guess. One thing we could look at is what about the future? What, where, where next? Um, where are you excited to go? What, what do you think is on the horizon? I mean, that's a really big question, but maybe in your area. Yeah. Um. One thing we could say for sure is it's definitely here to stay. I believe it's our, it's a new normal. So we had a new normal after COVID. We have another new normal after <laughs> after AI. So. And I, I'm, for me personally, I'm consciously optimistic on, on see what kind of um, search and discovery tools uh, people can come up with and what kind of augmentations, AI augmentations they're going to put on it. But in, this has been, yeah, I mean, uh, one thing that John also highlighted is that the ethical and privacy considerations should always be uh, at the forefront of things. And algorithmic bias will still exist. Uh, we do need to increase awareness and we need to be responsible in the use of AI, but 
yeah but so that's why i put i put myself as cautiously optimistic like i'm excited to know more about it but then you know we, we need to be cautious about the whole thing as well what do you think john well i well, i have hopes rather than thoughts i guess i, I think the importance of regulation and the importance of a regulatory framework and I don't know how far out into the future that would would be is is going to be absolutely critical. Um, there was a discussion at you, Bella, you've referenced the policy that you have at your institution. JISC mm -hmm. has a policy about use. That's very that seems very bottom up approach to making sure that these tools are used responsibly. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't know whether it will be the large um, tech providers, um, whether it would be Microsoft who have to you know put put a lot of these these guardrails in place to make sure that the technology is re used responsibly, whether or not government are playing catch up as, as the models are developed and as the tools proliferate, um, whether it's government have a role to play. And ultimately, I suppose, looking forward to the future, you hope that there are standards, shared standards that are understood um, incorporated into the work that everybody does because actually if you look further out into the future I, I, I guess it is um you know a lot of the a lot of the use of AI at the moment is in that creative space we can create fantastic images with some of those and um, image generation we can create fascinating texts but actually that the, the application of the of the tools probably does go to um, and I'm going to repeat myself, it's about that processing those large volumes of data. AI will really help when it does the dull stuff well. Um, and that can get out of the way. And then the human element, that kind of interpretation of the, of the data, the use of the data, the utility, if you like, that's the mm -hmm. thing that will make the difference. So we're hoping out into the, the future. If I, let's say, for example, I always take my job, for example, looking out into the future, I hope AI might be able to give me suggestions about what to do next. Where could we take Open Athens next? What aspects of the service should we should we improve? It can make suggestions, but ultimately any decisions on that should be taken by the community and the people I work with. Um, so I hope hopefully I will just make my life easier. Ah, isn't That'll that the point? I don't know. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I think uh, you mentioned government that reminded me that I think if there's any law in particular or like they need to kind of like settle on soon, that will be the copyright law, I believe, because um, the image generators, they kind of like train on, you know, copyrighted images, I believe. Yeah. And I, I think that's a bit, um, eh. <laughs> I mean, um, the benefit is there, but yeah, I guess uh, in, in a sense, it makes sense why people can be like, you know, um, not too keen on the whole fact that it was trained on copyrighted images, but. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't, have, I don't have the link to hand, but the Copyright Clearance Center to the organization, I think it's based in North America, but it has a huge amount of resources um, yeah. talking through the risks in, in that copyright and who owns the data and who, you know, again, yeah. that, that downstream chain as is, is images are generated using the work of others, um, you know, where does accountability lie in all of that? Yeah, that, that's like a, another set of, like another field of AI that people are like discussing on. So yeah, it, it's big. Yeah. That's pretty much taken us through the questions we kind of had in advance. I don't see any in the Q and A box, but I know John earlier you were you were referring to the accessibility gap and what we wanted to do about that. So I don't know if it's something you like wanted to talk about. Oh yeah, and I think that's important. That's I mean, it, it kind of relates to that conversation about the English language models. Um, I'm, I, I have a I, mean, I have a concern that those but you know someone made the point earlier if you look at the, the point of sustainability um, and the amount of computing power that is required to generate some of that you know I think I think um, that is it that is a challenge and actually I think there's a responsibility to make sure that the benefits from AI are are felt globally I think 
Um, it shouldn't just be so the ivory towers of academia have access to this kind of stuff. You would hope that the the, the data is is accessible to as many people as possible. I still think it, although it, though it has moved very quickly, I do think it's still really early stages. Um, I think there's that storming, norming, performing model, and at the moment, I think in the world of AI, we're we're still storming, and we probably will be for quite some time. And I think as, actually as use settles down as we settle on, on some some of those key technologies in those platforms they will become more accessible i think costs will come down and just because of that um more and more people will be able to take advantage of it Oh, sorry, Emma, could you repeat your question? Oh, yeah, I couldn't hear it properly. Oh, yeah, sure. So um, as, as a little chat we we're having a little bit early on about kind of the accessibility. So who basically who's going to get left behind in this? If everything goes down the AI route and you don't have access to the technology, um, kind of, I guess, how you would bridge that gap or whether it's a gap you're already seeing with your students, I don't know. Um, in terms of um, the students in our um university it's not that pronounced i think because um i guess singapore is in terms of technology singapore is quite um digital nation so to speak so in that sense in terms of whether it's acceptable for everybody i would say it is still relatively okay yeah at least for singapore context Oh, um, so we have, yeah, for Rosal Rosalia, Ros hello. Hello, so sorry, I'm so late. I couldn't sign in. I'm not sure what happened. Well, it's, it's great well, no. to have you here now. Thank you so much for inviting me. I feel so embarrassed now. Oh, no, not at all. You can pick up some, I mean, I I mean, Emma, I don't know if you want to sort of jump back to the beginning with some of the questions for Rosalia. I could, and I could run it if that's okay. Just run about my own experiences. Sure. Uh, I think that would be quite useful if that's helpful for people. Definitely. And I think, because, yeah. yeah. So I think because I'm studying at Stanford and I, I use AI very frequently, and I will bring you some examples of how the benefits of AI has been and some of the examples that we have seen in universities. And I think we, it's good that we have someone from SMU. And I remember during COVID that they had an AI um, um, sort of apparatus that allows people, uh, allows this, the faculty to see the students' eyeballs so that they can see whether they are cheating in exams. So those are the kinds of benefits I think AI will bring. But I think AI brings a lot more innovation and experimentation. I think in the first session that you have the professor from University of Leeds, I think I see uh, much more benefits coming from it. But I also see some problems in terms of the ethics of the use of AI. How do we safeguard uh, copyright uh, in terms of AI, in terms of the benefits? So I'm going, I'm going like a speed uh, tornado train here itself. Um, in terms of the practical implementation, I think most of you would have talked about is enhanced cataloging. Uh, metadata creation, uh, user query assistance, which uh, George, uh, Georgia Institute of Technology um, has used, uh, Stanford has used it. Uh, it allows us as students to be able to access the content 24 seven without the need of a research assistant. I think that will be really helpful uh, in terms of that. It is also about content creation and curation, right? So I use ChatGPT a lot in trying to get um, for example, simple definitions, where do I go to eat? What are uh, uh, the examples of use of uh, AI in the examples? And I find that some of the answers are getting better and better as, as, as we go on in terms of generating the right uh, kind of information. And I think AI is here to stay because students, even at Stanford, students like myself, we are using AI very frequently in what we do. And I think that's a really important element of it. But AI in the China perspective is something that I like to bring about very, very powerful where humans and AI works together. 
So the Chinese government in Shanghai has implemented a human AI um, learning for the kindergarten schools, and the AI is called Kiko. And Kiko provides the basic definitions of things to help the students, while the teacher provides perspective and making it much more creative and allowing the students to use the innovative part of their uh, the brain. And so I think we can both exist in 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 sign kind of. Uh, in this world, and I think AI is here to stay. So I think that's one of the beautiful part of it. Um, in terms of the library, I think uh, oper operational efficiencies will be gained, can allow librarians to really focus on the key aspects of skills that they need, sense-making abilities, understanding data, how do we allocate budgets, how do we make sure that we can automate the uh, book uh, processing, like students comes in and then the books is, AI gets a book for the students without the use of labor. And I think that's a lot of advantages that we can see in terms of the, of the students and the librarians itself. And finally, um, I think students, if I at my age is learning to use, uh, so at Stanford, I go into a virtual reality a classroom and I study there and then I did a practice of coaching with a um, with a bot a chat bot and I find the experience really wonderful really fantastic and I think what I'm going to say here is that we should learn to embrace it and not be fearful of AI and it, we still have got long ways to go but I think the more we learn about it, the more we can find advantages in the use of AI in libraries, remembering that the students of tomorrow is depending on the libraries and the universities to provide them with skills to make them more motivated because the student, the Gen Z likes tools like this. They want things that get them excited and we need to respond to their needs. And that's my quick summary. <laughs> That was excellent. Answered all the questions in five minutes. I'm very impressed. <laughs> no, that's, I, I'm, I have a, I've got a question. I have a question that that's related to the skills that we need to be giving to the students. For example, I mean, is it as simple as learning to write effective prompts? So, so I will take it from my example, right? So, when we had to learn how to go into first, first going into the classroom. It is as simple as ABC. The virtual reality is as simple as going in. You learn to navigate and you get the skills within half a second itself. And then when you're using AI uh, in writing a report of some sort, it initially requires a lot of proofreading. I think you have to take it with a pinch of salt in the beginning. The more information you fit into your chat, uh, GBT 4.0, and if the next one that is coming out, the more substance you're going to get out of the uh, the, the result that ChatGPT is going to give it to you. But it does require proofreading. It does require a level of us to look and say, does this make sense? Does this resonate with my own impression? Because remember that ChatGPT is getting information randomly from across all the open sources that is there. And what we need to do is to apply our own thinking, what we have learned, our practical experience in all of this. So say, for example, I'm doing a research on leadership and say value-based leadership, for example. And then I can get ChatGPT to do all the theories that comes with it. But the practical experience of a day-to-day -day activity, that has to come from me as a human being, not from ChatGPT. And I think that will give a much more objective, critical uh, research paper, if you like. Bella, did you have a response to that one? Yeah, I, I just like to echo Rosalia's experience. I agree because um, I think having talked to a few students um, um, about ChatGPT, uh, well, I was talking to them in the context of them learning code and uh, learning how to code and learning some technical stuff. I, I came to the conclusion, my personal conclusion that ChatGPT is actually, you get the most benefit if you are um, at an intermediate learner, like you know a bit of fundamental stuff, foundation, but maybe you don't know the advanced stuff uh, not so well. So I think that that's where you get the biggest benefit because if you were a novice, but you don't know you don't know anything, you don't know the foundation, you will not be able to evaluate. Uh, you don't have the basis to evaluate whether the things that ChatGPT came up with is you know 
true or is that accurate, that sort of thing. But and if you're an advanced learner, you probably don't need ChatGPT actually. You might even get a better, you can come up with a better answer than ChatGPT themselves. So it's true, yeah. So different um, benefit for different level of learners. And in addition, if I could add, so for, you know, uh, anyone who knows me, I'm extreme in terms of extrovert. But for those people who are not really comfortable, for example, in a coaching session or in a presentation session, actually, you can use AI tools to basically practice your skills in either, you know, presenting uh, in front of an audience or doing feedback or coaching session. You actually have a bot that is actually talking to you and giving you very concrete um, and constructive feedback on what you need to improve. And I think that is really helpful because then when we actually go into the real life situation, we have the tools, we have the skills without having to make a mistake in a real life example that, you know, that some of us will have to, uh, you know, uh, go through in, in the previous time itself. So there are benefits. There are, there are things that we can leverage on AI. But AI is not human being. I think that's the thing. It can't feel, it can't, it can't have the emotions that we do have. And I think that's something that we need to acknowledge, yeah. Thank you. Um, we have well, we have one question, which I'm gonna take before we, before we wrap up. Um, if people grow up with AI, do you think there is a risk of losing our skills and knowledge? Humans have rediscovered knowledge and skills we lost centuries ago. How? How could we or should we hold on to skills without losing them to AI or other innovations, or is it just inevitable? That is a very complex question, if you're asking. <laughs> I think so. Let me put a scenario here itself. You have, and a very simple thing like WhatsApp, right? A family is sitting on a table having dinner together, daughter and son is WhatsApping the parent that's sitting just across from them and not having a decent conversation like we used to have. And I think that is what this new generation are so equipped that the social skills of communicating with people, I think that we run the risk of that. Um, in the good old days, we do dating, right? We'll call, some, we get dated by somebody and we go out on a date. But these days, we are very comfortable dating somebody on a website and feeling very comfortable on having an online chat before we actually talk to the people. I think these are things that we have to accept that is coming. But I think as governments, as an organization, as a people, as parents, I think we need to inculcate a sense of social behavior that is actually becoming quite prominent, that people are very socially awkward. Like for example, I can't look at you in, into your eyes and have a conversation with you. And I think that is something that we need to invest. And that also takes upon mental wellness, isn't it? I think government needs to make sure that there's a, there's a balance. I think too much of everything is not good. Right. And I think that that question is a very apt question itself. But I think some bits are inevitable, but there is still time for us to make sure that we do not end up with a generation that is so robotic, uh, lack or devoid of any fine kind of emotions that uh, we are marrying based on what we call a, you know, a matrix that, you know, and say, OK, you are right for this person and you just go and marry the person without any feelings, I think that will be very sad if we come to that situation. Bella, did you have anything to add just to round up? Um, yeah, just to round up. So I, I agree with Rosalia. I think some of the things are inevitable and um, with, the, with AI, the new generation does come with a few quirks that can be a bit unexpected, like being socially awkward and all that. Um, just to add my observation after teaching, um, teaching uh, clinical workshops in my university is that, you know, the new generations, we always call them, oh, the digitally born, digital natives and all that. But I do find them, um, some some of them are lacking in what we, we, we think is a fundamental technical skill. Like, you know, the concept of files and folders, um, something as simple as that can be missing. So I think um, we do have to, take note of that in a sense like there, there might be just because they are in the sense that we cannot just assume things in that sense well there might be things that we take for granted that you know maybe good for the next generation to 
learn or equip themselves with, including, you know, social skills and all that. And I think in addition, I think the new generation is not able to distinguish fake news from reality uh, because of the over-reliance of what is on there. And if ChatGPT gives a fake um, answer to something, and we have seen in the initial one where journals do not exist and people are quoting journals, uh, and I think that is a risk that we run. And I think the other thing is really about critical thinking. Right, what that skills will get lost in all of it, and I think that is a very valuable part in any researcher, in any business person. That in order to succeed, you have to have critical thinking skills uh, to be able to look at the vast amount of information and make sense out of it. Which, you know, um, an AI can do some bits for you, but can't do in in all totality for you. On that note, I think we're a little bit over time, so I'm going to pass to John to round up for the day. But thank you, Bella, and thank you, Rosalia. Yeah, absolutely. Massive thanks to Bella, to Bella and Rosali. It's really interesting. I mean, I, there's so I'm going to do wrap up really quickly. I'm going to say thank you to everybody. Thank you to the whole team who've put this on. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, particular thanks to Laura Bloomfield Hall, who's led this whole thing from the Open Athens perspective. Um, thank you to our sponsor, that's technology from Sage. There's there's three things I'm going to end on. Um, it's that curiosity. That sense of community. There is an Open Athens community. There's a listserv, by the way, for Open Athens, which should, people are welcome to join. We should have more chat like this on the listserv. Less, how do I write a redirect a link? More, what's the future of AI? So I think that's really important. Um, we definitely live in interesting times. So I think we need to maintain our curiosity. We need to maintain that sense of community. And we definitely need to maintain our critical thinking. So if I think if we all focus on that, um, we will reap the benefits i think um from artificial artificial intelligence and ai um and libraries and publishers have got a fundamental role to play in all of that i'll stop talking now um thank you very much i hope people enjoy a good night's sleep or a lovely evening wherever you are in the world so thank you very much everybody thank you bye-bye bye-bye <laughs>